Uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so we're going to get into today's uh, prophetic word because it's intense. Maybe I'll put it that way. It's it's really something. So let's say a word of prayer and we're going to jump right in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your mighty word, oh God. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for everything that you've given us whereby we might know you because you created us for your glory. And we only exist, God, because you say so. We only exist because we're here to glorify you. So I just surrender right now, God. I die to myself. I surrender everything you've given me back to your use. So breathe through me, speak through me, oh God, my hand gestures, my words, my, my tongue, everything. Oh God, speak through me and let the message be communicated that you want communicated, oh Lord, that you might be glorified in all things so that the rhema word of God might come forth and the right exposition and ex, uh, exegesis of the written word of God would come forth so that you might be glorified and the saints would be edified and the demons would be terrified. Help us to tear down Satan's kingdom. You've already defeated him, but we need to realize that victory in our lives. And so we thank you for that opportunity to serve you with our lives and not waste our lives, but invest it in your eternal kingdom. So we're looking forward to great things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Now, when you come on the broadcast, please like and share. Okay, remember I told you that when a prophetic word goes forth, we want as many people as possible to see it uh, so that the body of Christ can be edified. Okay, so whatever it is that God is trying to say so that as many people as possible, again, can hear it. Okay, so today's live prophetic word. Today's live prophetic word is moving God. Moving God. That might sound strange to you, but you'll understand as we go forward. Moving God. That's today's live prophetic word. <clears throat> Our scripture reference is Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 through 33. It's a very familiar passage of scripture, but the Spirit of God will show us some new things as we deep dive into it. Okay, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, the New International Version. Okay, so Genesis 16, excuse me, Genesis 18, excuse me, Genesis chapter 18, Genesis first book in the Bible written by Moses. Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 through 33. Okay, remember that Moses spent all that one-on-one -on -one time with God on the mountain. And Moses and God had a face-to-face -face relationship that's very significant for what happens today, okay? And uh, so Moses is the one that God used to write down the first five books of the Bible. And Moses did that between the years of 80 and 120 in his life. Between 80 years of age and 120 years of age when he died, that's when Moses wrote, did all his writing and wrote the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, okay? So Genesis, the book of beginnings, chapter 18, verses 16 through 33. And I'm reading out of the NIV version. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. 
What if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him, what if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, he, Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, the Lord answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He, the Lord answered, said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. Lots there to unpack. Lots of principles, okay? So understand. <clears throat> Verse 17, the Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? First principle I wanna show you is that God can hide himself from you. Why do you think so many people make all these comments about God? Why do you think people do all these things in the name of God and they're clearly against scripture or whatever. You know why? Because they don't really know him. God can hide himself from you. God is a person. He is not a set of rules. Why do you think Jesus' biggest enemies were always the religious people? And when you come on the video, please like and share. We want this to be seen by as many people as possible. Why do you think Jesus' biggest enemies were the religious people? because religious people don't know the Lord and they don't wanna know the Lord. They wanna check off their boxes. They wanna say, I've kept the rules. They wanna say I'm righteous because of what I do. And none of that is true. You have to know God to know that, that none of that is true. That's all lies, okay? God can hide himself from you. You don't ever wanna to get to a point where God hides himself from you because God can hide himself from you as an individual. He can also hide himself from your family. That means, well, nobody in your family know the Lord, but he can also hide himself from a city. He can hide himself from a nation. God can withdraw from a nation and there'd be no word from the Lord and you wouldn't know what to do. So the Lord said, verse 17, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? <clears throat> and the Lord doesn't hide from Abraham because he says that surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he first tell his servants, the prophets, okay? Surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he first tell his servants, the prophets. That is Amos three and seven. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Stop, verse 18. Abraham had a huge destiny. He had a huge destiny. He was not just some dude, okay? Next principle is, are you aware of your destiny? Are you aware of the size of your destiny? Are you aware of the level of blessing that you are bringing or can bring onto the face of the earth? Because it does make a difference. If you don't understand that about yourself, I would say that you probably have low self-esteem. Maybe your parents or maybe your leaders and maybe no adult in your life in your formative years gave you a sense of destiny. So now you don't understand that every child you have, every word that you speak, every place that you go, you're changing the world. Don't you know if you just sit in your house all your life and don't do anything, you have changed the world because you have made the world a poorer place because you never made your contribution. That's why I work so hard to get out of me everything that God has put in me because I want to make my contribution because I understand that, that words make a difference. Do you have that sense about yourself? What if God is saying that you will become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the world are going to be blessed because of you? Okay, are you saying that? Do you know that? Do you feel that way about yourself? Is that the way you think of you? Because if not, you run the risk of being Esau. If you don't understand destiny, if you don't understand your destiny, and you don't understand what a huge destiny is or means, then you might fool around and sell your birthright for a bowl of soup. Like it doesn't mean anything. 
Okay? That's right. It's different if you have children by a blessed man. If you're going to drop a baby, if you're a woman and you're going to drop a baby, at least be like Hagar and drop a baby by a blessed man. Okay? Because Ishmael got blessed because he was Abraham's son. Okay? Because it made a difference. Are you aware of that? Are you aware of your own destiny? Are you aware of people of destiny? Are you aware of what that means? Okay? Verse 19, for I have chosen him so he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Verse 19, stop. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Now, you've heard me talk about this before, but I'm going to repeat it. Because repetition is the key to learning. There's no such thing as prosperity gospel. Sometimes you hear on the news people say that so-and-so is a prosperity preacher. There's no such thing as prosperity gospel. There's no such thing. Because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. It's not a separate thing. There is no one that followed God and obeyed God and believed God that didn't prosper. So there's no such thing as prosperity gospel, like it's a separate thing, okay? But there is such a thing as the false prosperity gospel. You want to know what that is? The false prosperity gospel says you can just do whatever you want to do and God will bless you anyway. That's the false prosperity gospel. That's what a lot of people preach and teach, and that's what a lot of people believe right now. Why do you think we have so many things, heinous things, immoral, unethical, ridiculous things done in the name of God, and people still expect to be blessed because they have bought into the false prosperity gospel, which says that you can just live any kind of way you want to, and God will bless you anyway. That is a lie of God's great great commandments are to love him, to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love yourself and then to love the one next to you, your neighbor, the way you love you. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. God said, any law I ever gave you and anybody I ever sent to talk to you, it's because I wanted you to love me. And I wanted you to love me with all that you have. And I want you to love you. And I want you to love the one next to you the way you love you. So when you find people that hate the Lord and hate themselves and hate you, and they're trying to put God's name on that. <laughs> that ought to tell you something. Okay? Because you can't just do anything you want to do and expect God to bless that and honor that. It does not work that way. God's kingdom doesn't work that way. And that's very significant. You're going to see why in a minute. Because God says of Abraham, I've chosen him because I know him. He's going to direct his children and his household. Not just his kids, but everybody that works for him. So in other words, everybody that's under the influence of Abraham, they're going to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that. So in other words, the Lord said, I know this man is going to tell his kids and his employees to do what is right and just and honor me, says the Lord, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he's promised him. That right there. You want the promises of God? You got to do what the Lord says do. One more time. If you want the promises of God to show up in your life, you have to obey. You have to do what the Lord says do. But the prophetic word today is moving God. So we need to move on. We need to get to that. So next, the Lord talks about the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Their sin is grievous. The Lord said, I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Stop. Do you know that your behavior reaches up to heaven. This is not the only time in the scripture where God talks about what people are doing reaching up to him. He talks about it in the days of Noah, how the, the wickedness that was on the earth reached up to him. God talks about it in the beginning of the book of Job, about how Job's name, Job was so just and Job feared God and Job lived as, as well as he knew how to the point where his reputation reached up to heaven and God was bragging on Job to the devil. The devil was calling Job out and God was bragging on Job because his name, 
Job's name and reputation had reached up to God's very throne. Do you know that how you live in your name can reach up to the very throne of God? Do you see how you can't walk with God for very long and keep no low self-esteem? Your very name, your very reputation, did you know that? And it works both ways. If you love the Lord, if you fear the Lord, if you serve the Lord, as best you know how, with all of your heart, that reaches up to his throne. But if you go the other way, and if you are as ungodly as possible, did you know that God comes down here in the invisible realm and watches to see if what he heard about us in heaven is true? It's just right there in the Bible. I just read it. You didn't know the Lord. That's why I started off by teaching you that God can hide himself. Just because you don't see the Lord, just because he moves in the invisible realm, doesn't mean he's not there. And if you got a reputation for being whatever it is that you are, good, bad, or ugly, the Lord will come down here in the invisible realm and check you out and see. Did you know that? But he doesn't just do that for individuals. He does it for cities. Now, I want you to think about that in the context of the city that you live in. Let me ask you a question. What is your city known for? The city you live in right now and or the city you grew up in, what's it known for? Did you know that God has come down here from heaven and looked at your city? Now, I'm from Chicago, Chicago land area. Chicago is known for a lot of things. We got sports teams. We got best hot dogs in the world. We got the best pizza in the world. We got Lakeshore Drive, uh, Fountain Square, Magnificent, Magnificent Mile. But we're also known for gun violence, okay? Don't you know that whatever reputation, reputation your city has, God Almighty comes down here and checks out to see if what he heard in heaven is actually the real deal. Did you know that? It's right there in the Bible, okay? Let's keep going. So... Abraham remained standing before the Lord. The Bible says the men turned away. Those were the angels that came with the Lord. Abraham approached the Lord and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Why was Abraham negotiating, bargaining, yea, even haggling with God about Sodom and Gomorrah? Because Lot was there, his nephew. And because Abraham didn't want his nephew to be swept away in the destruction of the city in case God decided to destroy the city. That's very significant. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Abraham said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep away, sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Stop. A lot of principles we need to get out of that. First thing I want you to understand is don't be listening to unbelievers about the way life works. Unbelieving people, people that don't know God, people that don't have the Holy Ghost, people that don't know the word. They think that they run the earth and they tolerate the church. I stopped by to tell you the word of God just told you that's backwards. The saints run the earth and tolerate the sinners. Did you know that? God just told you <laughs> that if there's a city full of sinners and they ain't but a handful of righteous people in it, he will spare that city because of the handful of righteous people. He will spare the city, the whole place. Did you understand that? I want you to start to understand the kind of power you have as a believer because unbelievers, sinner people, they think that they run the earth and religion is over. Religion is this fringe thing. And, you know, you religious people and that's what you religious people do. And we're off in our own little religious corner and we're just those crazy Jesus people and they run the earth. That's incorrect. OK, the saints run the earth. And tolerate the sinners and cities, entire cities are spared because the children of God are in them. Do you understand that? Entire cities are spared the wrath and judgment of God because 
unbelie uh, because believers, because Christians, because saints are in them. That also ought to tell you how badly we have messed up as humans if God had to send a global pandemic and shut the nations of the earth down. That ought to tell you how badly our sins have reached up to God's throne. If you wanna understand what sin is like before God, I want you to think about what it's like when you don't take out the trash in your home. What happens when you don't take out the trash in your home? Eventually that trash starts to pile up, but the smell, it's the smell, it's that stench. You can't take it. And you say, I gotta take this trash out right now because you can't take that smell, right? Is that right? That's what sin is like when it reaches up to God's nostrils. It's stench and he can get to the point where he can't take it anymore. But entire cities are spared because Christians are there. Do you understand that? So don't ever let, because I just read it to you in the scripture, don't ever let anyone that doesn't know God tell you that your presence in a city doesn't make a difference. Yes, it does. We just read where it does. Okay, now Abraham appealed to God's character. He said, will you really destroy the city and with 50 righteous people there? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Oh my goodness. I could do a whole broadcast just on that statement. But Abraham stood before God Almighty and said, you're not going to kill the righteous with the wicked. You're not going to treat the unbelievers like you treat the believers. Because there's only one line God draws in life. It's not a color line. It's not an age line. It's not a gender line. It's believers and unbelievers. That's the only difference God makes between people. And then Abraham said, it's not right for you to judge righteous people with wicked people. And the Lord agreed with him. Now, do you understand the inter intercessory power you have to go before the Lord as his child? Because unbelievers don't have that. They can't stand before God and claim his promises because they have no covenant with him. God does everything by covenant. And we have God's promises because we are his covenant children because of Jesus and because of Abraham. Well, Abraham stood before the Lord and said, you're not going to just wave your hand and wipe everybody out. Like there's no difference between righteous people and wicked people. And the Lord agreed with him. Did you get that? So treating the righteous and the wicked alike, but not the judge of all the earth do right. It ain't right for the same judgment to fall on believers as does on unbelievers. And God agreed with Abraham. Don't miss that. Then Abraham started to do something that that is not found that many places in the Bible. It is in the Bible more than one place, but this don't happen that much in the Bible. He started bargaining with God. He started haggling. He started, he started kind of pushing it with the Lord. Abraham started with 50 people and he went down in increments of five and then tens. And then Abraham got all the way down to 10 people. He got all the way down to 10 people. He got the Lord God Almighty to agree to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if he found 10 righteous people, okay? And so the prophetic word for today is called moving God. So what does the Holy Ghost want us to glean out of that scripture? The Holy Ghost wants us to glean that number one, you need to be sure that you are saved. <clears throat> I've discovered that there's a lot of things that people believe that just aren't true. They get them from fairy tales. And in our culture, by our, I mean American culture, we are a people that raises its children on a steady diet of fairy tales. One of the things that people believe about God that isn't true is that God's protection is automatic. That's not true. There's been so many people that have suffered accidents and tragedies and judgments, and so many things have happened in their lives and they get mad at God because they thought that God was supposed to protect them. God's promises of protection are only for believers. Did you know that? Only for the people that are in covenant with God, those are the only people that can actually claim his word. You can't claim his word if you are not born again and in covenant with him. Did you know that? 
So if you don't have a relationship with God, you are out there against the devil, against life, against your own flesh, and against wicked people on your own, by yourself. You understand that? That's why the devil just walks up to some people and just takes them out because you are not covered. He gives his, his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. It's for believers, not everybody. And I've discovered a whole lot of people don't know that. A whole lot of Christians don't know that. That's why people go through these things like all their kids burn up in a house fire, like there's a bad car accident, like something very tragic happens and they blame God. That means they thought that the protection of God is automatic. No, it's not. If you don't have a covenant of God, his promises are not talking to you. That's number one. Number two, what people believe is that there's some type of special protection for women, for pregnant women, for babies and children. None of that is true. Yeah, I know, I know, I just heard that bubble bust here. Yeah, your bubble just bursted. There is no special protection for you if you're a woman. There's no special protection for you if you're pregnant. There's no special protection for you if you are a baby. And there is no special protection for you if you are a child. Did you know that? When Moses was born, they slaughtered all them, them boys, them babies trying to get to him. When Jesus was born, Herod slaughtered all those boys under the age of two trying to get to Jesus. The Bible says in Revelation 12 that the dragon stood before the woman in travail to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's a picture of Jesus and Mary. But what the Bible's trying to teach you there also is that the devil don't care nothing about pregnant women. There's no special protection for you because you're pregnant. and no special protection for you because you're a woman. That's a fairy tale. That's not the truth. Gravity doesn't shut off to avoid a tragedy if the tragedy involves a baby. So if you would live in an apartment building, you live in a high rise and lots of high rises downtown in the city. If you live 30, 40 stories up and, and there's a bad banner, there's a bad railing and you done fooled around and left your patio door open and your baby has crawled out to that patio door and that baby hits that bad railing and goes over the edge. Gravity doesn't look up and say, oh, Lord, that's a baby. I better shut off to avoid a tragedy. That is not what happened. That baby going to fall and that baby going to die, most likely. Do you understand? Because there is no special protection if you are a baby. That's a fairy tale. That's why people, they, these tragic things happen to pregnant women. That like sometimes when women get them babies cut out of them. I remember the first time I heard a story like that. I was like, what the world? Tragic things happening to women and pregnant women and babies and children. And people get mad at God. You know why you get mad at God? Because you thought there was some type of special protection. The devil don't care nothing about pregnant women. Gravity don't care nothing about babies. That's the way you learn to develop depth perception is by edges. You keep bumping into an edge and we bump to the edges. It hurts. I mean, do you remember doing that with your kids? Or you might remember when you was a kid, but you've seen it. Baby's on the couch, baby's on the ground. They see the edge of a table. They stand up too soon or they don't, whatever. And you get, oh, Lord, it hurts. It hurts really bad, too. That's how your brain learns how to recognize edges. When you're on the couch and then you keep falling over and cracking your head. That's how your brain teaches you to recognize what an edge is. You understand that? There's no special protection for women, pregnant women, babies, and children. That's a lie. If you want your family protected, you better be in covenant with God. When I claim Psalm 91, because I read the whole chapter, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I claim that for me and mine, okay? Me and my house. Because the Bible says the just man walks in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. That means if I walk uprightly before God, my children have to be blessed. The Bible says, therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That means if I choose life, it's going to trickle down to my children. See, because that's the way the covenant works. It don't just happen because you have children. It don't just happen because they're babies. It don't just happen because you're a woman. All that is a lie. And that's why when these things happen, 
That's the devil who walked up to you and popped you right in the face because you got no protection from God because you are not in covenant with God and his promises do not just automatically apply to you. This is what people don't understand. And when people see all this death and all this destruction and his judgment, his judgment, they don't understand it because they thought that you can just do whatever you want to do on the face of the earth and God is not going to answer you. But we read in the scripture that whatever the reputation is of your city, God is going to come and investigate it personally. Okay? But the promises of God apply to the righteous, not to all of humanity. Yes, there's a level of grace God has to give us every day so we can breathe and move and go to work. Yes. But the covenantal promises of God only apply to those that are in covenant with him. And that's why so many people to this day are mad with God because they suffered an accident when they were young. They suffered a tragedy like a house fire or a flood or a car accident or, or a rape or something happened to them that was traumatic. And they're mad at God because they don't understand. There's no automatic protection for anybody. God's promises are for those that are in covenant with him. It don't happen just because you're a woman. It don't happen just because you're pregnant. I can't stress that enough. So that's why Abraham had to go before God and said, if you find righteous people, that's why he had to say that. How come he couldn't just say, if you find people in Sodom and Gomorrah? Because that wouldn't have cut it. He said, if you find 50 righteous people, and then he bargained it down and bargained it down and bargained it down and got all the way down to 10. But it still had to be 10 righteous people. And God said, if I can find 10 righteous people, then I'll spare the whole place. God said, if I can find pe 10 people that are living for me, that love me, that honor me, that fear me, that that mercy will then extend to the entire city. Okay? So you have to stop believing this idea that you can move God just because of reasons. <laughs> because the Bible teaches us here how you move God. You move God first and foremost if you are in covenant with him, because if you are not in covenant with him, then his promises don't apply to you. You move God because you are obedient. That's what God said of Abraham. God said, I know this man. This man will not only teach his children, he will teach people that work for him how to love me, fear me, and serve me. Then God said, then I'm going to bring everything I promised on him, because I know what Abraham going to do. Okay? Then God demonstrated that whatever reputation a city has, the Lord is going to come personally check it out. And just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not watching. And then Abram had to go before God and bargain the wrath of God down, the judgment of God down to 10 people. And he did it on the basis of God's character. He said that you're the judge of all the earth. It's not right for you to judge the righteous with the wicked. Now, do you see that there is a line that is spiritually drawn in the sand and all the people that tell you that they don't need Jesus, that they don't need a savior, that they don't need the blood of Jesus? Let me tell you a few things about that. First thing I want to tell you about that is the Holy Ghost taught me <clears throat> one of the tricks and the approaches of the devil. The Holy Ghost said one of the favorite things that the devil loves to do is leave you alone for the first 40 years of your life. If the devil leaves you alone for the first 40 years of your life, you will have less of a tendency to develop faith because you feel like I'm doing fine. Second thing I learned was that what people really think life is about. When you talk to people about Jesus, they will point to their house. <clears throat> Excuse me, they will point to their spouse. They will point to their family and they will point to their career. If you've got a nice house, if you've got a nice spouse, your wife's nice, nice looking, your husband's nice looking, if you've got a good job and you have some beautiful children, people will say, I'm fine. What do I need Jesus for? I'm fine. The devil is laughing at you. The devil's going to give you the first 40 years to establish that life because that means you have not spent 40 years building up your faith. It means you spent 40 years building all those other things because you thought that's what made you okay. And then the devil will draw back his clawed hand 
and throw cancer spots on your lungs. And then the devil will go to your car and mess up one of the wheels on your car or the devil will uh, call somebody a drunk driver to come down and all of a sudden a tragedy happens, an accident happens and all of a sudden you're just taken out, 40 years of age and you're just gone. And then people have the nerve to get mad at God. That wasn't God. That wasn't God. Because you believed if my spouse is attractive, you believe if my house is nice, you believe if I have children, and you believe if I go to work every day, I don't need Jesus, I'm fine. That's a lie. How do we know that's a lie? Because Abraham did not bargain before God on the basis of spouse, career, house, or children. He said righteous. He said, if you find 50 righteous people, not 50 working people, if you find 50 righteous people, not 50 married people, if you find 50 righteous people, not 50 people that are parents, that ain't what he said. Do you understand? You can't stand before God on the basis of your house. You can't stand before God on the basis of your spouse. You can't stand before God on the basis of your kids. You can't stand before God on the basis of your job. Now, why am I saying all this? Why did the Holy Ghost want to show us all this? Why is this important? I'll tell you why. Hear me well, because those of you that know the Lord, we're, we're moving now. We're going to have to move now to a different kind, a different level, a different dimension of intercession. If you're not already pray, praying for your family, you should be. Now, I pray for mine every day. Remember how I always tell you, there's never anything I'm telling you that I'm not doing. I pray for me and mine every day. Every day I draw breath. I bring my kids and their families up before the Lord. Just so you know. But we're going to have to start interceding for these cities and we're going to have to start interceding for these extended families because the judgment of God is here. We are in a Sodom and Gomorrah situation. We are in a Noah situation on the earth right now. And there's going to be a lot of people that don't make it out of 2020. If you want your family to live on past this year, you're going to have to intercede before God and ask the Lord to have mercy. If you've got a big family and ain't but two saved people in it, ask the Lord to have mercy on your family for the sake of them two righteous. If you live in a big city and there's a lot of corruption in your city, ask the Lord to have mercy on your city because you're there. Otherwise, you're going to start to see even more families and even more cities get wiped out. Everybody keeps trying to make this be the end of the pandemic. Everybody keeps trying to make this be the end of Corona. I stopped by to tell you prophetically, this is just the beginning. Because it's judgment. It's judgment on things that have been going on in America and in the world for decades, sometimes for generations. And this thing is not about to wind up no time soon. And so we as believers are going to have to start interceding for your family. You ought to be praying. If you marry, you ought to be bringing your spouse and your marriage before the Lord every day. If you have children and or grandchildren, you ought to be bringing them before the Lord every day. But you need to start extending that to other members of your family because some people are not going to make it out of 2020. We need, to, we need to lay prostrate before God and begin to intercede and ask the Lord for mercy. And the same is true with our cities. If we want our cities to get restored, then we're going to have to ask the Lord to have mercy because righteous people are there and God is not just going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked. When God did, if you don't know the end of that story, when God did judge Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels went and got Lot out first because the angel said, we can't do anything until you leave. See, so God heard Abraham's prayer there were less than 10 people, so judgment still came, but he did not destroy Lot and his family with the wicked people. The angels told Lot, you got to get up, get your family, get your hat. We can't do anything until you leave. That's the power of intercession. That's the power of having righteous people in the city. And you need to know that you're making a difference in the city you live in right now, whether you knew that or not. So you need to start praying for your city, your town, your village, whatever it is that you live, that God would have mercy. 
because of your being there. If ain't but one righteous person there is you, okay? Because that's how we can move the Lord. We have to do it like Abraham did it. Otherwise, there's gonna be so much more. I can't tell you everything. There's gonna be so much more that's coming because there's some more stuff coming that I can't quite tell you about yet, but if the, if the Lord gives me the release to tell you, I'll tell you at some point, there's more stuff coming, stuff you haven't seen yet, stuff a lot of people haven't thought of. That's why we need to be sure that we're covering our families and our cities with prayer and that God will hear us, that, that we can move God to hear and, and to extend his grace to our families for generations to come. Otherwise, do you know what can happen? Entire bloodlines can be cut off. Entire bloodlines. That means you can hit a point where your family is going to stop. There's not going to be any more of you. Did you know that? Did you know such a thing was possible? There's all kinds of ways it can happen. Uh, like even if there's a generation of all girls, that means at some point the name is going away. You might be able to keep the name as a middle name. But at some point, if those women have children, they're going to be the children of the man they had them by. And so there's all kinds of ways your family can come to an end. Just no more Greens, no more Johnsons, no more Taylors, no more Whites, no more McGillicuddy's, no more Rosenbaum's, just no more, just boom. You understand? We're pushing up on stuff like that. We're pushing up on stuff like that when entire bloodline is going to start to get wiped out. So what we need to do is we need to know that we can move the Lord because we are his children. That God will hear us as we are obedient. God watches us. God watches how we live. And God wants to bring, bring his blessings on us as we obey. Because of that covenantal relationship, we can go before him and begin to ask for mercy for our families and for our entire cities. And he'll hear us as he did with Abraham. Okay, we have to start doing that. Because again, this is just the beginning of sorrows. Okay, I can tell you this. Start looking for new strains. They say that the corona keeps morphing and it does. They're gonna be a new strain though, a new strain they haven't seen yet. Because they keep talking about, when this thing first hit, they said the doctors that were telling the truth that we'll have a cure 2021 earliest, because remember they have to test it and they have to look and see if there's any long-term side effects or whatever, because you can't just whip up a cure. You have to have some type of testing period. How do you know? You know, there are all kinds of factors, age, gender, ethnicity, weight, diet, pre-existing medical conditions. How do you know if you have a universal cure unless you test it on as many people as possible? Mm -hmm. So they keep saying, you know, by 2020, we're gonna have this comprehensive vaccine. They're going to be a new strain, Some, <laughs> something they haven't seen yet, okay? So I can't tell you everything, but this is what I mean when I say this was coming. So this is what we have to do now. Now, there's a policy in my family that I'm going to share with you and my son can tell you. In my family, we don't leave the house without being covered with prayer. So whenever any of mine is over here, before they walk back out that door, I say, stop it, we pray. And I plead the blood of Jesus over him and I pray Psalm 91 and I pray that God keep his arms around him before I send him back out into the world. That's a policy in my family that you won't come in my house and leave out without prayer. Okay, that's just the way we roll. Start instituting policies like that to where every time you part company with your spouse or your kids, you just put your hands on them, just say a quick prayer and ask God to watch over them and keep them. Okay, now remember I told you, I don't know if I told you on my live stream, but I'll repeat it here. Remember I told you when Corona first hit, I went outside and I felt all this pressure. I felt like something was squeezing me like this. I felt a pressure here. I'm like, what is this? And I felt it just like you see me doing it now. I felt I was like, what, what is going on? And then I realized it was demons. So I rebuked him in the name of Jesus. I said, you cannot infect me. You can't touch my body. You can't touch my lungs. You got to back up off me. And I saw them back up off me and they did because I had to speak to them unclean spirits in the name of Jesus, but I understand demonology, I understand casting out unclean spirits, I understand that's my right in Christ, not because of me, David, because I don't have 
any righteousness of my own, but because of Jesus and his righteousness, and I'm in covenant with him, I therefore have the right in him to cast out unclean spirits and tell them they got no authority over me. He's my authority. I'm underneath his authority, not the kingdom of darkness. And they can't just walk up on me and inflict me, but they was trying. And I felt them, and I felt it when I walked out the house when Corona first hit. I'm like, yeah, no. You understand what I mean? If you don't know that, if you don't understand any of what I just said, that's what I mean about as a believer, why you have to be strong in the word because you have rights in Christ. And the enemy it can't just walk up to you and inflict you with stuff like that. But unbelievers, he can. That's what they don't understand. Without the blood of Jesus, without the name of Jesus, without the righteousness of Jesus covering you, the devil can just walk up to you and throw stuff on you and you won't even know it's him. And then he's going to get in your ear and whisper, if God is so good, why did this happen to you? To try to make you hate God. To try to poison you against the one source you can go to that can actually get you healed. So going forward, this is the kind of knowledge we have to have, and these are the kinds of things we have to do. Don't leave your spouse in the morning for work, and y'all don't pray. If you didn't do that before, do it now. Don't let your kids get away from you. Don't let them leave your home without covering them with prayer. If you didn't do that before, do it now. If you don't have a family time of prayer, institute one. Tell your family, we're going to get on the phone, we're going to get on the Zoom chat, we're going to get on something, and we're going to pray as a family. I'm talking about aunts, uncles, cousins, extended family, grandparents that are still alive, in-laws, whatever. Do it as a family. That's what has to happen now. Okay? So hear what I'm saying prophetically. Hear what I'm saying by the Holy Ghost. Because, what is this? It's August, right? In three more months, in three more months, you're going to see a whole bunch of new death. <laughs> and you're going to see a whole bunch of people drop dead that didn't ever think that would happen to them. Because they won't hear what the Holy Ghost is saying now. This is where we start have to start praying now, okay? And don't let it stop with your family. Let it extend to your city. Let me ask you a question. What would you do if your city completely shut down? You say, but Prophet Taylor's already shut down. It's not completely shut down. I'm talking about all the emergency services. I'm talking about water and groceries. What would you do? What would you do if it got so bad until the grocery stores had to close? No plastic shield, no mask. No, nothing. People couldn't go in and you could no longer get fresh produce. What would you do? What would you do if at the main water plant in your city, they shut the water off or the water got so corrupted, you couldn't drink it, couldn't cook with it, couldn't bathe in it. What would you do? What would you do if there was no emergency services, no police, no fire, no 911? So you have a medical emergency somewhere and there's no ambulance to call. You have a fire and there's no fire department to call. You're in trouble. You feel like you're threatened. Maybe somebody's breaking in your house and there's no 911, there's no police. What would you do? So don't tell me it can't get worse. Don't tell me, see, because we're still dealing with trying to get sports going again and, and, and music concerts and restaurants and school. That's what the debates are now. Don't tell me that an entire city can't be shut down worse than it has been because of emergency services, water, and food. What you gonna do if that goes away? What would you do? That's what I'm, don't tell me it can't get worse. So this is what I mean when I say, we're gonna have to start interceding for our cities, asking God for mercy in the midst of judgment that he would spare even though the sins of our cities and our nations have reached up to heaven and God has dropped the pandemic that shut the world down. And finally, our churches. Now I did a whole video on it with our churches. I suggest you go back and look at it. But remember I told you there's many things that the Lord wants instituted in our churches that we weren't doing before. That's why God just wiped all that out. Okay, I stopped by to tell you, it ain't gonna never be like it was. If you wait for things, to be back like they were, they're never going to be like they were before. The world is never going to be like it was before March. America is never going to be like it was. That is not coming back. So how stupid do you have to be for God to wipe everything out? And then you go back and try to build something that God has shut the door on. We have to start instituting the new things that the Lord wants. And those new things are just really biblical things, things that 
we should have been doing all along, but what were we doing? We were doing Easter parade, you know, because some folks are seeing me as Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. We was doing hat parade, because you know what, them big church mama hats. We was doing uh, fried chicken dinners. We was doing the fried chicken committee. We was doing, you can't park in that space because that's pastor space. We was doing, this person ain't saving, that person ain't saving, this ain't saving, that ain't saving. We was doing, if people live in any kind of way they want to, we're going to look the other way because they're the worship team leader or they're the whatever. We was doing, I'm going to go to church, but I'm going to hate everybody I go to church with. Oh, Lord, I love you. But I can't even be nice to my brother or my sister. I'm like, That's what we was doing. And God shut all that mess down. Don't you know that God doesn't have any bad Sundays? Some people were still at a point where they're like, well, the spirit was high today. Spirit is high every day. God doesn't have any bad Sundays. God doesn't have any bad services. When, how? You don't know how to do prophetic worship. You don't know how to invoke his name and his presence until he comes in the room. And you don't know how to worship him until the glory of God fills the room. Because that is supposed to happen every Sunday. You worship him until his glory fills the room. And the Bible teaches you the principles on how to make that happen. God doesn't have any down Sundays. We were letting people come to church sick and they leave in sick. We were letting people come to church broken and they leave broken. And the Lord is not pleased with that. We have dishonored his legacy of physical healing because there's nobody. I challenge you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's nobody that came to Jesus or that they brought to Jesus, or like the women with the issue of blood that fought their way to Jesus that didn't get healed. There's not one time where the Lord said, for the glory of God, you have to stay sick. That's not in the Bible. That's in a bunch of religious people. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says over and over again, all manner of sickness, all manner of disease, all manner of illness, the maimed, the lame, the blind, the halt, and he healed them all. We letting people come to church in wheelchairs, leave out in wheelchairs. We letting people come to church with broken limbs, leave out with broken limbs. We letting people come to earth, come to church with chronic illnesses and they leave with chronic illnesses because all we doing is all this religious stuff and ain't no power of God flowing, you know, Holy Ghost power flowing. Okay, and the Lord was not pleased with all that. That's why he shut all that down. So going forward, we need to build according to the Bible pattern to the, what the Lord says, that these signs and wonders shall follow them that believe, that we heal the sick and raise the dead, that we lay hands on the sick, that they recover, that unclean spirits are cast out, that sins are forgiven, that, that a big one for me is uh, fertility. There's too many of God's daughters that want to have babies that haven't had babies. I'm like, what Bible are you reading? Okay, if you and your husband haven't been able to conceive, but you want a child, you go before the Lord and you find a prophet and you get a word from the Lord about your fertility. If there's a reason you can't conceive, that's why you need the prophet. Like, for example, in Hannah's situation, the reason Hannah couldn't conceive is because the Lord was trying to get her attention because the Lord was trying to send Samuel through Hannah. So God had to make a covenant with Hannah to help Hannah understand, you're going to have to give this boy up to his destiny. I'm going to send him to you. I'm going to let you have children. But you're going to have to turn Samuel over to me as soon as you get through weaning him, because that boy is a prophet from the womb, and I got to raise him up to lead Israel. So that's why you need prophets. That's why God makes us. If you've been having problems having children and you want children, you got to find a prophet and get a word from the Lord. Why, Lord? Why can't we conceive? and let the Holy Ghost tell you through the mouth of the prophet. And then once you get your answer, if there's something that needs to be repented of or some sin you need to confess, or there was divine destiny at stake and you didn't know it and now you know, then according to the time of life, God will visit you and you can have children. How God's daughters not gonna know that? I don't understand that. If you are a daughter of God and you want children, you can go and find yourself a prophet and ask the Lord, why don't I have children and get a word and get some understanding? And if there's something to be repented of and sins that need to be forgiven, you can get a word and go before the Lord and say, God, please help me to live right and help me to have children. That's what I'm talking about. We, we're not supposed to be letting these couples, these infertile couples come to church and then leave with no hope of having a baby. What Bible are you reading? 
signs and wonders and and if you receive this word that's being released right now, signs and wonders and miracles going to show up in your life today. Remember last week I told you stuff was going to happen before the sun sets? And then uh, when we had my family prayer, we would say the same thing. And some stuff happened that same day. That same day, some stuff happened. And we saw it in the spirit. And it was really something. Same day. Ain't supposed to be waiting on 20 years. I'm about we got to wait on the Lord. That's another. See, I'm going to do I'm gonna do a top 10 misquoted scriptures kind of thing. Because that's one of them. And signs and wonders are supposed to be following us. Just like they did Peter and John. Just like they did Jesus. Just like they did Matthew and Philip. Is no Jesus hasn't changed, the word hasn't changed, the Holy Ghost hasn't changed, Father God hasn't changed. And we have to get back to the place where they understand as Christians, when you come to the saints, that the sign and the wonder and the miracle power of God is gonna manifest. And you're gonna know you had an encounter with the Lord and you're not gonna leave the same. That's what the Lord is looking for. Not all that religious stuff we were doing. Arguing about how big the churches are well, I go to a mega church. Well, I go to a mega, mega church. Well, my pastor's on in 20 countries. Well, my pastor's on in 40 countries. That ain't, oh, Lord Jesus. That ain't, we preaching about cars and houses through the false prosperity gospel. Preaching about cars. There ain't nothing wrong with cars. and nothing wrong with houses. And that's biblical. God will give you houses you didn't build and vineyards and olive trees you didn't plant. But not without relationship with him. Got so far into the false prosperity prosperity gospel till we don't forgot to cross. Till we don't forgot that you got to take up your cross. You got to do what the Lord is telling you to do. And prosperity is a byproduct of faith and obedience. But we didn't got so so hard over here into, into how many members were, that were in the stadium and how many broadcast countries and oh, my pastor's so famous and blah, 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 until you have forgotten the relationship with Christ. You have fallen in love with the byproducts and you have left the first love of just loving Jesus. Because I grew up around a church full of people that just love the Lord. Houses, large or small, cars, great, fancy, plain, didn't matter. They love the Lord and they had so much Holy Ghost. When they talk, they speak in tongues. They couldn't finish a sentence without speaking in tongues because they love the Lord and they served him and they feared him and they lived holy and they taught us young people by example. That's what we have to go back to. Okay. So receive all that. Walk in it. Receive the prophetic word and make it a part of your life today. And you'll see manifestation today. Before this day is over, before the sun sets, you will see that prophetic word that you just heard. You'll see signs and wonders and miracles erupting out of your own soul, out of your own body, out of your own home. If you believe and receive that word that was just released. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. Uh, there's more I could say, but I'm going to just keep it to an hour. I uh, went a little bit longer than I thought, but you know, maybe I'll pick up some more last time because there's more. Like I said, I'm scratching the surface, but I can't tell you everything now. But <clears throat> just receive what you've heard today. Uh, remember, I told you believe it, receive it, say it, and obey it. Believe that it's true. Receive it means it's true for me. Say it means I confess what the word of God says. I say what the Lord says. And obedience means I make my choices lined up with what God said. Believe it, receive it, say it, obey it. Okay? All right. Now I'm going to go in the spirit and ask the Holy Ghost, is there anything else he wants me to say? And then we'll wrap up. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, now, you know, I don't do what I do for money, but if you want to sow into my ministry, you can sow my cash app. My cash app is dollar sign DMT2. Um, and I'll put that on all my channels, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook Live, and then the YouTube video will drop in several hours because uh, I have a new format with the U new uh, YouTube video. And I also have my third quarter prophetic devotional out. Uh, you should get it. Uh, July's already gone, but my prophetic devotional allows you to read a prophetic scripture every day. Now, these scriptures were chosen by the Holy Ghost. I prayed over them every day and asked the Holy Ghost, what scripture do you want for this day? So they're not in chronological order. They're in the order the Holy Ghost wanted them in the book. 
So you can read about a prophet, a prophet's experience. You can read about God prophesying, God saying, I'm going to bring this to pass. You can bring, read about that every day and get revelation on it, but you can write it down journal style. It's not just a devotional where you read the scripture. It's a devotional with a journal built in where you can write down what the Lord is saying. This is what you need. The reason I created these books, the reason the Lord put this in my heart is because you need to increase your prophetic. Okay? The pro See, okay, there's a level of prophetic that's for every Christian. That's 1 Corinthians 14. Read it. Read 1 Corinthians 14. You see, every Christian is supposed to walk in a level of the prophetic. The gift of prophecy is a higher level. It has a stronger anointing, and it has more specific things. Where can we get the journals? That's a good question, and I will give you a good answer. I will put a link right on the page. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, anyway, so the reason that it's so important is because you need to be increasing your prophetic. What would you do if you lost internet access? What would you do? Just what would you do if, if things changed and just something got worse? You need to learn how to get a prophetic word from the Lord yourself. You understand that? You need to get a prophetic word from God yourself. And to do that, you need to increase your prophetic, your level of the prophetic, your water level of the prophetic. And not only should you, you can. The office of a prophet is something different. The office of a prophet has a stronger anointing. The office of a prophet has uh, a specific mission field and it has mantles. And it has uh, a whole bunch of things that come along with the office. So everyone is not um, called to the office of a prophet, but everyone is called to walk in the prophetic. You can do that. Okay. So here is the link. All right, right here on my Facebook page now, and there's the link. Okay, so click on that link, and that'll uh, help you get the journal. You need to be increasing your prophetic every day. Okay, you need to be increasing your prophetic every day. You need to be increasing your prophetic every day. That's a long link. I'll put it up on the screen. That's a long link. You can go to lulu.com and look up David Taylor, too, or look up Daily Prophetic Devotional. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a link right there. But uh, you need to be increasing your prophetic every day so that you can, when you look at Scripture, the Spirit of God can give you prophetic revelation so you can understand prophecy, so you can understand how to exegete Scripture prophetically and let the Holy Ghost talk to you, so you can understand how if God wants to give you prognostication, and prognostication means to see the future. Okay, prophecy is not prognostication. To prophesy means to speak by divinely inspired utterance. It means to speak by the Holy Ghost. Sometimes that is telling forth the truth of God, but sometimes it is foretelling, and that's prognostication where you can see the future. Okay? So you need to walk in that for yourself. And so that's why these journals were created, so that every day you can be meditating on a prophet, a prophecy, watching the Lord prophesy, reading what the Bible has to say about the prophetic, and strengthening, strengthening your prophetic. And there's all kinds of ways God can deal with you. God can deal with you in dreams. He can deal with you in visions. He can deal with you. You can get sights or sounds. Uh, he can put stuff in your heart. He can give you what's called a burning heart, meaning that God puts something in your heart so strong you just can't shake it. So many different ways God can deal with you, which is why you don't you want don't want to lock into a method. You want to lock into Christ. So you want to find out however it is that Christ deals with you in the prophetic. It'll be particular to you. For example, you might get a deeper prayer language. You might get a deeper level of tongues. You might get a deeper level of interpretation of tongues. There's so many things that can happen 
But you need to be increasing your prophetic every day so that when these things begin to hit, you will know them before they happen. You will know them when you see them. You can recognize when the Holy Ghost is speaking and when he's not, and when somebody just running their mouth. Because everybody out here running their mouth talking about they're a prophet, not a prophet. Everybody out here running their mouth talking about they're flowing in the prophetic, ain't flowing in the prophetic. You need to be able to recognize that for yourself. How do I know that? How can I make a statement like that? Because when the Lord speaks, it comes to pass. That's how. If God says something, it's going to happen. It doesn't matter if it takes 400 years, it's going to happen. If it's by the Holy Ghost, it's going to happen, just like the Holy Ghost said it. That's how I know. And some of these people out there are just doing this right here. Okay? Can I prove that in my own ministry? Yes, I can. You want to know how I can prove it? I will show you how I can prove it. And here's how we're going to do that. <clears throat> I'm going to put my prophetic locator word. I'll put a link here. And my prophetic locator word on my YouTube channel. I have a, a word that I released for the beginning of 2020 on January 1st. Go back and look at that word now and see if that word release hasn't come to pass. Uh, part of that word said that there's going to be major global shifts. It's right there on the thumbnail, right there on the screen. You will experience major shifts this year in your life and also internationally. And only those that have been listening to me and do listen to me are going to make it. I said that on January 1st of this year. Has that come to pass? See, that's not me. I'm not bragging. I'm not taking any credit because I'm just a man. I'm just clean breath and I ain't got nothing to brag on. I'm saying that that's the mark of the prophetic. If the Lord said it, it's going to come to pass the same way the Lord said it. That's how you discern between people that are actually prophesying and just running their mouth. But for you to know that you got to be strong in the word. You got to be strong in your own prophetic. So that's what these journals are for. So you can. Uh, get in the word every day, study a prophet's life, study a prophetic scripture, let the Holy Ghost begin to minister to you, okay? And and then you'll, you'll begin to, to fine tune and you begin to charge and you'll begin to increase your sensitivity to the prophetic. And however it is that God deals with you, dreams, visions, burning heart, uh, things you can't shake, uh, journaling, whatever. The Lord deals with us all differently, okay? But he will deal with you and you will get strong in the prophetic. That's what is required now for us to make it through the rest of this year because, you know, we didn't turn it to the second half of 2020. You don't want to wait until stuff happens and find out with everybody else. You want to know when something's going to hit before it happens, which only comes through the prophetic. Only the Holy Ghost can do that. Can't no man do that. Only the Holy Ghost can tell you for sure this going to happen, and in three months, this going to happen, and in six months, this going to happen. That only happens by the Holy Ghost through the prophetic. There's nothing else that's going to be accurate except the prophetic from the Spirit of God. It doesn't matter whose mouth it comes out of. It matters that it's the Holy Ghost talking. Okay? All right. Amen and God bless. So like I said, if you'd like to donate to my ministry, you can donate to my cash app. I, I, I just told you why you need to get the prophetic journal because you need to be strengthening your own prophetic. Don't you know if you have kids, don't you know that God will tell you who your children are before they're born and what they're supposed to do? Do you know that? Don't you know that if you're not supposed to go to work today or you're not supposed to take a certain road to work, that there's danger on that road? Don't you know that the Holy Ghost will speak to you and say, don't go that way? Did you know that? Did you know if you're not supposed to buy food from a certain place, a certain grocery store, a certain supermarket, or there's something you're supposed to be alone, did you know that the Holy Ghost can speak to you and say, don't buy that? Did you know that when you pay tithes and you pay offerings, when you keep God first in your finances, did you know that God will lead you to bargains? Did you know that? I gave you my testimony uh, that one time 
but it happens in my life all the time. God will lead you to bargains. Did you know that? Did you know that God will lead you to quality products at discounted prices, at bargains, at sales, at a whole bunch of things? And he'll, he'll show you when to go where if you didn't know that. All those things come through the prophetic. All those things come through the Holy Ghost. That's why you got to develop that relationship because a whole lot of Christians are missing out. And you don't want to be one of those Christians that ends up leaving here early because you didn't know how to rebuke the devil because the Holy Ghost told you to get ready to rebuke the devil and you didn't know what he was talking about. Then you find yourself in, in a spiritual battle, a spiritual fight, and you don't know what to do. Okay? All right. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. So this is Sunday, August 2nd. So I will be here next Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my regular prophetic word, 2.30. And I will be back for my No More Genies teaching on Thursday, August, August 13th, 7 p.m. I'll be there for No More Genies. Now, the last thing I'm going to say before I sign off is I want you to sign up for my newsletter. On my Facebook Live page, go at, at the top where the logo is, and it says sign up. Uh, I sent out a weekly newsletter where you can have all this stuff in one space in your inbox. So all the latest products I have out, because I'm working on a whole bunch of new ministry uh, tools I'm going to put out. So you know what the latest tools are. So if I put them on sale, if there's discounts, you can get those first through the newsletter. So if there's any videos or any teachings that you missed, if there's any articles on the website that you didn't know were there, all that kind of stuff is in my newsletter. So go to that place where it says sign up on my Facebook Live page, uh, facebook.com slash Prophet David Taylor, and sign up for my newsletter so you can get all that information in your inbox. It comes Friday morning at 7 a.m. And it says PDT Weekly Newsletter. Now, I might change that to Prophet David Taylor so you know it's me because you might not recognize the initials. But it'll say PDT and or Prophet David Taylor Weekly Newsletter and they don't have the date, they are released Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Friday morning at 7 a.m. Why do I release them then? Because when I release new music, I release it on Friday at noon. So there'll be a note and a link in there so you can watch me live when I release the new music, okay? Uh, this first Friday coming up is the first Friday of the month. That means I'm dropping a new hymn. So uh, Friday the 7th of August, there will be a new hymn as well. So you see you see all the stuff I got going on? I got a whole bunch of stuff going on. So that's why you need to get on a newsletter so you can keep up with all that, okay? All right, amen and God bless. Thank you so much. And I will see you same time next week, uh, Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen, God bless. And remember, we need to start moving God for the days to come. Amen and amen. Satan tries to threaten, and sickness is his weapon. To fill my days with strife, and cut me off.